we finished earlier uh, today with uh, listing four roles of the law under the Old Covenant. Do you remember what they were? <coughs> Drop quiz, huh? The four roles of the law under the Old Covenant. We, we looked at four dispensations. Thank you. Somebody was listening. Ten points for that one. Sorry? Convict the sinner of sin. One, two... Teach the Israelites the gospel. Teach the Israelites the gospel. Somebody's cheating. You've got them written down, don't you? <laughs> but that's good. That is good. At least you took notes. <laughs> convince the sinner. Uh, sorry. Convince the sinner of sin. Teach the Israelites the gospel. What's the third one? Entry to the body of Israel. As an, it served as an entry point into the body of Israel. And govern the morals and the laws. Govern the morals and the lives of the Israelites. It taught them how to relate to God. It taught them how to relate to their neighbor. It taught them how to relate to their wife and their children and so forth. Four points. Thank you for those who've been taking notes. I might not have remembered them if it was not for you. So thank you. Okay, now that's where we ended. We saw that this was the, the role of the law under the old covenant. But as we looked earlier today that in the first century, God was moving his people from the old covenant, from the dispensation of the law into the dispensation of grace. And the apostles had to deal with those who were opposing, namely the Jews. Now, the four, four roles of the law that we looked at, as we come, as we migrate into the, the new dispensation, the dispensation of grace, where does the law fit? We saw and we established as well that Paul did not mean to do away with the law, right? He did not do away with the law, as, as many Christians would like to believe. No, he didn't. But where does the law fit? How am I, as a Christian who is living under the new dispensation, who, as we saw earlier, I'm a greater than the greatest of all the prophets because I live in the kingdom of God, how do I relate to the law of God? The Israelite under the old covenant related to the law of God by doing what the law says. Do this, don't do that. By being convicted of sin. By learning from it the gospel. And by using it as an entry uh, point into the body of Christ. If you can use this word back in the Old Testament. Or the body of God or the body of Israel, the commonwealth of Israel. How does that migrate into the new covenant? We saw, we quoted from Paul from uh, Romans that uh, the law, Paul says the law was given to make uh, sin exceedingly sinful. So is the role of the law as an avenue, as the means to convict the sinner of sin still valid? Yes, yes. that's what Paul said in the new Testament. He said, uh, sin was dead, but when the law came, sin revived, and I died. Sin convinces or convicts the sinner, uh, the law rather, convicts the sinner of sin. So this role of the law moves or migrates from the old dispensation or the dispensation of the law into the dispensation of grace. The law does still convict the sinner of sin. It is still a mirror by which you look at and you see your condition. The second one was, it was given to teach the Israelites the gospel. It was given to teach the Israelites of what the Messiah will do, and, and uh, when he will do what he do, and, and so forth. <coughs> Can we carry that into the new dispensation? Yes. Especially as Adventists, we look into the sanctuary, and we see so many uh, rituals and so many ceremonies that the Israelites did that un unpacks many beautiful truths and many beautiful treasures, right? Every aspect of the century had a lesson. So we can still learn from these laws and from these rituals that God instituted on Mount Sinai. We can still look back at them and learn many lessons. So we can still use it as an instrument to teach. However, as people who are living in the new covenant, as people who are living on this side of the cross, we have the life of Christ that we can look at and we learn much deeper aspects. We have the fruits of the Spirit that Paul said. You know, I always say uh, the Ten Commandments... Don't take this too theologically, but the Ten Commandments is righteousness for dummies. What I mean by that is, it's very easy for me not to kill you if I hate you. All what the commandment says, thou shalt not kill. Very easy for me not to kill you. But it's very hard for me to love you if I don't like you. That's the fruits of the Spirit, right? We have greater revelation now. But still, it does not undo the role or the position of the law as an instrument to teach aspects about the gospel. 
Number three, what was number three? It was to serve as an entry point. Uh, what's, what's the word that I use? As an entry point into the body of Israel or the commonwealth of Israel. Now, I spent the whole morning giving you the background of what a Jew would have thought and believed. What's, what's the culture that Jewish person came from, an Israelite came from, what the background, what his system of belief was. That's what we looked at earlier this morning. Now, this, this, this Israelite, which Paul was one of them, right? He was a Hebrew of the Hebrew, circumcised the eighth day as to the law, perfect, he says, and, and so forth, right? He, was, he excelled above his, his fellow Jewish people in the life of the Jews. Uh, what would a Jew say? Is the law still uh, an entry point into the commonwealth of Israel to become an heir of the promise, to become a partaker of the body of Christ? What would a Jew say? Yes. Yes. Because according to the Jew, if you are uh, if you are part, to become part of the body of Israel, you must be circumcised because you cannot be uncircumcised and do the things that God said. So as far as a Jew was concerned, you had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. In quotation marks. Right? That's, that's what he understood. Now, whether they took it as legalistically or took it as whatever you want to whatever you want to say, it, regardless which way you look at that statement, you must be circumcised or keep the law of Moses. It has some truth in it, in that the law in and of itself could not save. Never did save, never will save. No circumcision, no keeping any law of Moses could save under the old covenant or under the new covenant. It just can't, right? But to a Jew under the old covenant, if you had a good relationship with God, you would Obey. Isn't this what we say now in the, in the New Covenant? Isn't this what James says? Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith that works, we say, right? First, faith that works and does what? In the New Covenant. Does what? Obey. Obey what God said, right? This is a principle. Now you take this principle, put it in the old covenant. As far as a Jew was concerned, yes, you're saved by faith. Yes, you're saved by grace. But if you are saved by grace, if you're saved by faith, you will obey. What will you obey? What God revealed. One of which was circumcision and keeping the law of Moses. There you have it. That's a Jewish mindset that Paul was dealing with. We'll deal more with it now. But the fourth point was what? Of the role of the law. Govern the lives and the morals of the Israelites, the moral life of the Israelites. It told them how to deal with their neighbor, how to deal with their wife, how to deal with their children and everybody else. Are we to carry this role of the law into the new covenant? Yes, some of it supposed to guard us. Principles, not the policies. Good, good, okay, that, that, it's going to be an interesting sermon. <laughs> an Israelite did what he did because the law said so. The law controlled the life of the Israelite. You're still talking about a Jew now. A Jew, under the old covenant. Now we have the new dispensation, dispensation of grace, and we'll see where does the law fit in that. My uh, say, my take on it, that what I'm trying to put to you tonight is no, no. That role of the law as a governor to govern your life, control what you do and what you don't do, tell you what to do and what to do, does not migrate into the new covenant. And that is the main point of Paul's letter to the Galatians. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. <coughs> the law convicts the sinner of sin. Yes, the law can teach us of some aspects of the gospel. Yes, but the law under the new dispensation cannot be used as an entryway into the commonwealth of Israel, cannot be used as a way to relate to God through the law. And the law cannot be used as a governor to govern our lives. It just can't. That's an old covenant way to relate to the law. 
not a new covenant way to relate to the law. Somebody has a comment. Will, will, uh, give me time. Give me time. <laughs> good, good. But I'm glad. I'm glad. Somebody has a comment that means somebody is excited about it and might not like what I have to say, which gets me more excited. That is good. Now, uh, we're going to go to the letter to the Galatians. How many of you have read the letter to the Galatians? Okay. How many of you studied the letter to the Galatians? <laughs> Less than. Okay. All right. Good. Now, I, I just want to give you a slight background of my attachment to the letter of Galatians. I've been preaching the gospel for eight years. But it was only in the past three or four years when I was challenged by an ex-Amish guy in America about a verse in the letter to the Galatians. When I, it was then when I realized I don't understand Paul's main point of that letter. And I went and studied it. And the result was freedom. Not freedom to sin, but freedom in Christ. Don't ask me to explain it anymore. I don't know. It was just an internal freedom that I experienced. The letter to Galatians, I believe, revived me and gave me a correct and a deep understanding of the gospel. So I love this letter. Hence, I don't have notes. I'm not going by notes. I'm just going to go see where, where my eyes hit and we'll talk about that. I just need to ask you a few questions before we look at this letter. Why was the letter written by Paul to the Galatian church? Circumcision. Because, um, he Circumcision? Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, no, no, I'm pointing. Paul was surprised, he was marveled that uh, the gospel that he preached to them, some people came in and removed the gospel. Yeah. Especially the grace of God. You know? Yeah. You are so soon removed from the gospel unto another gospel, which is not another but you've been deceived into receiving another. So the reason that was written, you, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head there, but we're getting to that. The reason the letter, uh, Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians is because the Galatians were being removed from the gospel. The gospel was being taken from them, right? What was the problem in the Galatian church? Now you can say. Okay. Did you hear what, uh, what's been said? Circumcision. What was, what, you said something to say, Matthew? No? <laughs> What was the problem? Was it Eric? You said something? Following the, Jews. Following the Jews. The problem in the Galatian church was that after Paul established that church, deceivers, Judaizers came and started bringing in something, a new teaching, a legalistic teaching into the church. And the church received it and as a result, they started departing from the gospel. Now Paul tells them in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 21. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 21. He tells them, Tell me ye that desire to be under the law. Whatever was preached to these people made them desire to be under the law. And you pointed out, correctly so, that what was preached to them was circumcision. As he says in chapter 5, uh, verse uh, 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And so forth. And he goes on to say. He says, if you want to be circumcised, Christ is of no profit to you, is useless to you. Because the Judaizers came into the Galatian church and started preaching to them that unless you be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Did we hear this before somewhere? That's the gospel that they believed in. That's, that's, that's what they preached. That's what the Jews evangelized for 2,000 years. Now, since Christ came... Something different happened, but these Jews did not want to change. They kept following Paul and saying, no, 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 no. Unless you are circumcised and keep the law of Moses, unless you enter the body of Israel the way we enter it, you cannot be saved. That's what they were teaching. The church at Galatia accepted that teaching, and as a result, they desired to be under the law. What does that mean? Under the yoke? They desire to be under what? To be circumcised. They desire to be controlled by the law. They desire to go under the administration of the law. They desire to go under the dispensation of the law. They desire to be saved in the same way they thought the Jews were saved. That is the entry point through the law into the commonwealth of Israel. 
That was the problem in Galatia. <coughs> the problem in Galatia was not committing sin. In Corinthians, for example, the problem was committing sin. A man taking his father's wife. They arguing and getting drunk at communion and so forth. The problem in Corinthians was sin, was breaking the law. This was not the case with the Galatian church. It was the total opposite. The problem with the Galatian church was that they were being legalistic. They wanted to be under the control of the law. They wanted to be saved by keeping the law. You following me? It was not paganism. It was not seeking, desiring to break the law and be under the condemnation of the law. No, no, no. They desire to be under the control of the law. That was the problem. So what was Paul trying to correct? Say again. What did you say? Legalistic. Paul was trying to correct the legalistic belief system that they had adopted. It's very important to understand that, to keep that in mind as you read the letter to the Galatians. Because based on your understanding of what the problem is at Galatia, you will interpret Paul's solution. The problem was legalism and Paul was dealing with legalism. That's why he wrote the letter. Now, we don't have time to go through it all. I'll just highlight some things. In chapter 1, he, he tells them that you're departing from the gospel. Then he tells them how he accepted the gospel, that no man preached it to him, but Christ himself preached it to, uh, preached to him. And then he says in chapter 2, then 14 years after, I went up, up again to Jerusalem, that's chapter 2 verse 1, with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. That 14 years later, when he, when he went up to Jerusalem, that was in Acts 15. He went up to have the council with the apostles in Acts 15 about what should we teach the Gentiles. Should we teach them to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses or not? And he held us. Who did he take with him? Barnabas, Barnabas and who? Titus. Titus. Who was Titus? A Greek. A Greek. Let's keep reading. Verse 2. But I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, that's the apostles and the disciples and so forth, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, listen to what he's saying, neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. What is he saying? Yes, Titus was a Gentile. And he said, look, I took Titus with me to Jerusalem, to that council in Acts 15 with the apostles. And Titus, who is a Gentile, was not compelled to be circumcised. He's telling them something. He's telling the Galatian church that the gospel that I preached to you was accepted and approved of by the apostles. The evidence is Titus, who is uncircumcised and who is a Gentile, was not compelled to be circumcised. Because the apostles agreed with me that circumcision is not necessary for a Gentile. That's what he's saying. Right? You with me? <laughs> Verse 4, And that because of false brethren unaware brought in, who came in privily to spy our, out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Liberty in what? And bondage... To what? No. To the law. Controlled. Controlled by the law. How do we know that? In chapter 4, he gives an analogy about uh, Sarah and Hagar. Uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse uh, 22. We won't read it all. It says, Abraham had two sons, one of the bondwoman, the other of the free woman. And he goes talking, he says, it's an allegory of the two covenants in verse 24. That one is free and one is in bondage. Well, let's read it. Verse 24. Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. The one from the man Sinai which gendereth to what? Bondage. bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is man Sinai in Arabia and answer to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So, according to Paul, in the same letter, the old covenant gendereth to bondage. So when he said this... These men that spy, came to spy our liberty, the liberty that we have from that system of the law, and they tried to bring us into bondage or into bondage under the old covenant or under the administration of the law. And he says, we gave them not a place, blah, blah, blah. And he goes on talking. And then he faces Peter. And I, I want to get to the main point is in chapter 3, halfway through chapter 3 and onward. That's why I'm rushing through it. And then in the beginning of chapter 3, 
verse 1, it says, O foolish, O foolish Galatian, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified. This only what I know, what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith. Paul is telling tell me something. How did you receive this Spirit? How did you receive this life, this new life? Is it by the law? Is it by the administration of the law? Or is it by the Spirit? By the administration of the Spirit. How did you receive this Spirit? By the law or hearing of faith. He says, Having begun in the Spirit, are you made perfect in the flesh? Having begun under, having begun under this ministration of the Spirit, received a new life under it. Do you think you're going to make made it perfect by the flesh or by the works of the law? That's his argument. And then he goes to Abraham in verse 6. Abraham believed God, what is accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And then in verse 8 he says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Who is that thee referring to? Abraham, in this verse, Abraham, you're right. But you're right also if you said Jesus, because if you jump down to verse uh, 16, thank you. He says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, which is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So when God promised Abraham and told him that in thee, or as he says in verse 16, in thy seed, which is Christ, all nations shall be blessed. What is he saying? The gospel is in Christ, all nations shall be blessed. That's the gospel that was promised to Abraham back then, before Mount Sinai, before the old covenant began. God promised to Abraham that time will come when all nations will be blessed in Christ. So then, verse 9, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful, faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. He says, look, if you're going to be under the law, if you're going to go back to this dispensation of being under the law, menstruation of the law, you're under a curse. Because the law says, that law you want to be under, the law says, curse is everyone who does not continue in all these things to do them. And then he says something, uh, revealing. <coughs> But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evidence for the just shall live how? Perfect. By faith. But guess what, he says, but guess what? The law is not of faith. That's verse 12. But the man that does them shall live in them. We saw this verse earlier. The man that does them shall live in them. This was the condition of the old covenant. You do, you live. You obey, you live. And Paul is telling him, hang on a second. The law is not of faith. The law cannot save you. Salvation is only by faith, and the law is not of faith. So don't go to the law. Don't desire to be under the law. He's warming up to his, uh, his biggest argument <coughs> that is coming. Let's jump down to verse 17. He says, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, that's the covenant that God made with Abraham. He says, The law which was 430 years after, after the promise made to Abraham, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. In simple English, he's saying, look, that law which came 430 years after God made a promise to Abraham cannot change the promise. God made a promise. Tell me something. You who have children, have you ever promised your child anything? Yes. Yes. Promise to take him to the park, right? Is there any condition for promises? Sometimes. But a promise is, I promise that if I see you next year, I'm going to give you $100. Don't hold me to it. I'm not going to give you $100. But I promise. Uh, who made the promise? Did you make it? Who, what does the promise depend upon for its fulfillment? You? Me. I made a promise and it's my responsibility to fulfill the promise. God made a promise to Abraham. 
Abraham didn't ask him for the promise. Abraham didn't ask for anything. God gave him a promise. And whose responsibility is it to fulfill the promise? God. The promise is a one-way thing. Sorry? There was also no condition for No condition for that promise. It was God from his own initiative made a promise to Abraham. He told him, I promise you, Abraham, time will come when I'm going to bless all nations through your seed, through Christ. That is the promise. And Paul is highlighting now, he's telling, look, God made this promise to Abraham, and this law that came 430 years cannot add or change or cannot do anything to change the promise. 4, verse 18. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. <coughs> now notice what he says in verse 19. Now, b before you read it, imagine you're a Jew. And uh, you went after Paul to the church in Galatia. And, and you're trying to, to bring in your gospel, legalism, to the Galatian church. And here is a faithful member that heard what Paul preached and said, hang on a second, that's not what Paul taught us. Paul taught us that, you know, it's a promise made to Abraham. It, it's for free. God promised your father, Abraham, that he's going to, you know, extend this and give us his promise of the Spirit to us Gentiles for free by faith. And the Jew would say, yes, yes, but Paul didn't tell you that a later revelation of God was on Mount Sinai. The latest covenant that God made with His people is on Mount Sinai. The law. You got you to follow the law, man. Yes, God made a promise to Abraham, but then God revealed more things on Mount Sinai. You got to follow the law. Now, Paul, after he says, look, God gave Abraham a promise. 430 years, he made a covenant on Mount Sinai. But let me tell you something. This law that was revealed on Mount Sinai cannot affect this promise. The natural question that will come from a Jew who's standing there in the church of Galatia and listening, hearing the letter being read, what will the question be? Hang on a second. If that is true, why did God give the law then? Right? If you're telling me this law that God gave 430 years is not going to do anything to the promise, why did God give it then? That's a natural question. Remember, Paul sent the letter. Paul didn't go to the church. He sent the letter. Now, in his, if I was in his place, I would want to be familiar with the argument that the Judaizers are giving, and I would want to rebut it. Because I know when the letter gets there, the Judaizers will still be in the church. They will hear my letter being read. So that's what Paul is doing, right? We don't have what the Judaizers being been have been teaching, but we can deduct it a bit. So Paul anticipates the question that the Judaizers will ask. After he said that the law, 430 years, cannot change the promise, he asks the question himself in verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? What, what, what's the purpose of the law? Why was the law given? Notice his answer. It was added because of transgression. What's the next word? Say it with a loud voice. Till. Till. The seed should come to whom the promise was made. Stop there. Paul anticipates the question that the Jews will ask. Why, was, why did God give the law? He says, yeah, wherefore serves the law then? Why was the law given? And he tells them why. He says, it was added, it was given because of transgression. That's what we saw earlier. That it might make sin exceeding sinful. It was added because of transgression. But his next word is very vital. Till. Until. In other words, he's saying, look, God highlighted, magnified the law. God put the law up there as a, as a governor, as a ruler. God put you up in the administration of the law until. For a time period. Till the seed should come to whom the promises was made. What seed is he talking about? How do we know that? Verse 16. Verse 16. But, but he's giving you identification there. He's not just saying, till the seed should come. No, no. He's telling you, till the seed, to whom the promises were made. Few verses earlier, he told you now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Not a seed as a many, but as a one of Christ. So he's saying, till the seed, to whom the promise was made, or till Christ should come. So, 
for how long did God intend the law to be the governor and the ruler of the people? What does the text say? Till the seed come. When did, when did Jesus come as the seed of Abraham or as the seed of the woman? Bethlehem. Have you ever heard of anybody saying uh, this coming is referring to the second coming? Well, I taught that in the past. Don't ask me why, but I did. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't hear me. It, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Paul is saying that God made the law your governor. God put you under the administration, administration of the law. God allowed the law to control and govern your life for a season. That season ends when the seed comes to whom the promises was made. He didn't say that season end when the promise is fulfilled. He didn't say that. He said the season end till the seed should come. Which seed? To whom the promises was made. Just saying, anticipating what the Judaizers will come after me and teach. Because <coughs> uh, I've heard it before. Let's carry on reading. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Notice his next verse, very confusing verse, verse 20. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Take that. <laughs> what? What is he saying? He said, look, God gave this law, established on Mount Sinai, under administration of the law for a season till the seed should come. And then he says about this law that was established. It was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Who was the mediator of the old covenant? God. Moses. Oh. Moses. He was the mediator, right? Moses was the mediator. And then he says, now a mediator is not a mediator of one. What does he mean? What does he mean? Remember when I said before about a promise? If I made you a promise... Who should fulfill the promise? You. Me. Do I need a mediator to fulfill, fulfill, fulfill the promise? But, but, if we had an agreement that if you give me $300,000, I'll give you my house. Do we usually use a mediator? Yes. yes. A covenant or an agreement is different than a promise. An agreement is, if you do, I will do. That needs a mediator. A promise is not like that. And that's what Paul is highlighting here. He's saying, look, now a mediator is not a mediator of one. He just told you that it was ordained by the hands of mediator, that old covenant. And let me tell you something. The fact that there was a mediator in that covenant tells you it's not the promise. Because the mediator is not a mediator of one. Obviously, there is more than one party. That's what he's saying. There are two parties. There are the people and there is God. And a mediator was mediating between the people and God. That's what he's saying. He's telling you the fact that there was a mediator in that old covenant is an evidence that it's not that promise. It's not the fulfillment of the promise. But God is one. He says, verse 21, Is it then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Have you ever wondered if there is anything God could not do? Did, did, did you come up with an answer? Could not lie? Could not die? Well, 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 here is something that God could not do. Paul is telling you. God could not give a law by which life will be earned. He says, If there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. What he's saying is, it's not even possible to give a law that will earn your life. Because had that been possible, the righteousness should, should have been by the law and not by promise. That's something God could not do. He could not give a law that will earn your life. This tells us something that the life that God gives us, it's not just a record in heaven. It's not just a change of mind that God has towards us. It's an actual something physical that you receive here on earth. It's the life of Jesus Christ that you receive. And no law could produce the life of Christ. 
No law could produce the life of Christ. Okay. Verse 22, but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The promise by what? Whose faith? Jesus of Jesus Christ. When did that come? When he was born. And he lived. The scripture says that he's the author and finisher of our faith. He's pointing now to something, to, to, to the life of Christ, to this side of the dispensation, this dispensation. And he says that the promise that was promised to Abraham by the faith, by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now, I want you to notice something. When Paul says things like this, especially in this letter, to them that believe, we read and we just keep reading. But, but he, he's, he's making a point. When he says to them that believe, He's, it's as if he's rubbing it into the Judaizer, you know. There you go. To them that believe. In other words, to them that only or believe only. Not believe and work. Not believe and be circumcised. Not believe and keep the law of Moses. No. To them that believe full stop. The promise of the Spirit. God will give to them that believe. What shall we do to work the works of God? They asked Jesus. What did Jesus say? Believe. Believe. On him whom God has sent. If you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, thou shalt be saved, Paul said. That's what Paul is saying in here. To them that believe without works. <coughs> okay, he's getting now to the, to the heart of the argument. But before faith came, stop for a second. Reason with me. Before faith came, well, earlier today we saw in Hebrews chapter 11 all these heroes of what? Of faith. He just told you that Abraham was justified how? By faith. And all those who are of faith are the children of Abraham. What do you mean before faith? I thought faith always existed. Or is he talking about something else? Is he talking about the faith of Jesus? Or that system of faith? Or that dispensation of faith? Or that dispensation of grace? And he's saying... Before faith, before that system of faith, before the dispensation of faith or grace, ministration of faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. <coughs> it's, a, it's a pregnant verse, this one. Before faith came, before that system of faith came, we were kept. Have you ever looked up the meaning of the word kept? It's a loaded word. What is it? Locked? Yes. Kept. That word, that Greek word means guarded by a military guard. Or when, when you invade a city and the guards keep the, the people inside the city so they don't escape. Besiege. Kept means guarded, protected, hedged. In other words, he's saying, but before the system of faith came, we were kept, guarded, protected under the law or under the dispensation of the law. We were kept or guarded by the law. The law governed our lives. That's what we saw earlier today, right? The, the law uh, protected us, told us what to do, what not to do, uh, controlled us morally. That's what he's saying. Before the system of faith came, before the dispensation of grace came, we were kept or guarded under the law. We were controlled by the law, by the system of the law, shut up unto the faith or that system of faith, which should afterward be revealed. Since Mount Sinai till the cross, they were shut up under the law, kept under the law, waiting for that faith that should be revealed or that system of faith or that dispensation of grace that will be revealed, which started after Pentecost. Wherefore, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Have you ever looked up the word schoolmaster? You know, <coughs> sorry? I don't know the Greek word. I know the meaning of the Greek word, but I don't know. 
You know, remember how I told you that if we can read the scriptures with a first century Jewish mindset, we'll understand so much of it? Well, even if you read it with a first century Roman mindset, you'll get so much out of it. Schoolmaster, you look it up. If you don't believe me, just look it up. Uh, what they used to do back then in that century, they would choose a trusted servant and they will put that trusted servant in charge of the young people to control their morals, to guide them to school and back from school to make sure they're protected and they are behaving. All that is in one word. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was that instrument that God used as the servant to control the children, Israel when they were children, before they came to the cross. We saw, you know, in that presentation earlier, the ear and then the plant and then the, it's growing and eventually it becomes the, ready for harvest. Remember? We saw it. The law was our schoolmaster or that instrument that God used to control the morals and the lives of his people until when? To bring us unto Christ. That's the exact same thing he said earlier. That the law, it was added because of transgression, till the seed should come, or till Christ come. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, after that system of faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Okay. I've read too much, explained too much, but I'm not sort of linking it with what I said before. Remember when I asked you the question, that role of the law as the, as the one that governs our moral life, tells us what to do and what not to do. Do we migrate this role of the law into the new covenant? No. Some said yes, some said maybe, some said I'm not sure. Paul is answering it for you. He says, look, the law was our schoolmaster, govern, control our moral lives. To bring us to Christ. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are no longer under the system of the law. We are under Christ. But who is Paul talking to here? Yes, he's talking to us. But he's talking to the Galatian church who has been deceived to desire to be under the law. And especially to the Judaizers who are sitting there and believing and teaching that unless you be circumcised and keep the law of Moses... You cannot be saved. In other words, what Paul is saying, hang on a second. Don't you realize that that dispensation, ministration of the law finished and we are no longer under that ministration? We are under a new ministration now. We are under a new dispensation. Dispensation of grace. Dispensation of faith. In other words, what he's telling them is you, 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 your belief system might be correct, but your belief system finished at the cross. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are no longer under that ministration of the law. We are under a new system now. The system of faith. You, you following his argument? Yeah? I surely hope so. He says, For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Under the system of faith, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is no difference. He has taken down the middle wall of partition <coughs> and he has made both one in Christ Jesus. Under this new dispensation. Now, what's the time? How much time have we taken so far? Forty-five minutes. Come on, man. Cut me some grace. <laughs> Half an hour ago, no? <laughs> Forty-five minutes. Okay, wait. There's, yeah, look. Go on our website, Revelation 14, 12, and download the book. It's for free. The Law and the Everlasting Gospel. The Law and the Everlasting Gospel. I, I go in detail more about this. What I'm sharing is just portions of it. <clears throat> But just to speed it up quickly, because I want to have a practical application for us, but, but chapter 4 is, is beautiful as well. I don't want to miss it. Paul just proved that the old ministration, ministration of the law was the schoolmaster until Christ. 
the law entered and was there till Christ. Now notice what he says, well, last verse of chapter 3. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Who is he talking about now? Those, um, Gentiles. Gentiles. And when he says heirs according to the promise, he's talking about God's people, right? Mm -hmm. they heirs. According. Now listen to the analogy he gives in chapter 4. He gives two analogies. I don't think we'll have time to go through both of them. We'll start with one and see how we go. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. What does that mean? He's not the boss yet. The heir, the owner of the estate. As long as he's under age, he's not any better than a servant. Though he is the Lord of all. Why? He tells you why. The next verse. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So that under age heir who inherited the whole estate is not any better than a servant. Because he's controlled by tutors and governors. They tell him what to do and what, and what not to do. Until. That is the case. Until the time appointed of the father. Let's say age 18 or age 21 or whatever it is. When he gets to that time appointed of the father. He's no longer under the tutors and governors. Right? Now he explains it and he applies it to us. He says, even so, verse 3. Even so, we, when we were children... We're in bondage under the elements of the world. What does that mean? What's the elements of the world? Or rudiments of the world? I think you think your thinking is correct. He just told you the law is our schoolmaster. The law is our schoolmaster until Christ. The law entered the... Until Christ. Uh, we are no longer under, under a schoolmaster. When faith is come, we are no longer un, under a schoolmaster. Then he says, a child is not better than a servant because he's under tutors and governors. And when he applies it to us, he says, even so we, who is we? The Jews, the Gentiles, all God's people. When we were children back then, when we were children, we were under, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. The elements of the world is the law. The elements of the world is the schoolmaster. But someone say, <laughs> hang on a second. What do you mean elements of the world? It's the law of God. It's holy and just and good. Well, uh, what makes you think that elements of the world is a bad word anyway? Elements of the world or rudiments of the world. Rudiments, the word rudiments or element means the, the elementary things. The things that you learn when you're a baby. The, the ABCs of things, right? The ABCs of righteousness, if you want to put it in this context. The law tells you, do this, don't do this. This is a sin. This is good. Don't do this, but do this. It's the ABCs of righteousness. But still somebody will say, well, the, the, you know, elements of the world, the word, surely world can apply. But Paul says, under the old covenant, they had a worldly sanctuary. Is that a bad word? No. Elements of the world is referring to the law that was given to control their life while they were living on this world. The law was weak, the, Paul says in Romans, in that it could not uh, condemn sin in the flesh. Just because it says weak about the law it doesn't mean it's bad. Just because it's worldly about the sanctuary it doesn't mean it's bad. So these elements of the world is saying we were in bondage when we were children. We are in bondage under the elements of the world. He's referring to the law, the administration of the law. We are under it. But listen what he says in verse 4. But when the fullness of time has come, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made a woman, made under the law. Remember in the example he said, the heir is not any better than a servant because he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Now I will tell you what does that mean. That means when we were children, we were under the control of the law. But when the time appointed of the father has come, but in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made a wound, made under the law. That's the exact same thing he said. The law entered the offense my abound. Or sorry, he says the law was added because of transgression till the seed should come. 
The coming of the seed is the birth of Christ. So, the law as an entry point into the body of Israel, the law as a controller of the morals and the lives of God's people, does not fit in the new dispensation. You cannot relate to God through laws. You cannot relate to God through ceremonies and rituals. That's not how God wants to be related to anymore. This was accepted back here, but it's no longer accepted here because we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now the time has come where we are no longer children, but we are grown ups. Because, he says in verse uh, 6, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now you have the spirit of Christ. Now you have the life of Christ. You are no longer controlled by the law. The law doesn't govern your life. All right, all this is nice and beautiful and all that. Our last five minutes or so, I want to spend them on a, what does that mean practically to me? What does that mean to you today? All right, well, that's, that sounds, well, well done. Well, what does that sounds good? But what does that mean to me today, you know? Well, here is what it means. Why do you do what you do? Why do you keep the Sabbath? Why do you have quiet time? Why do you have worship at home? Why do you pay tithes? Why do you eat vegetarian food? Why do you wear a long skirt? There was a time when I first became a Christian. I had a business in waterproofing. I had to start my, leave the house at 6 o'clock. I used to lovingly, joyously wake up at 5, 4.30 in the morning to open the Bible and read. I loved it. But then I joined some Christian circles. And they would, you know, search in, in, in writings of inspired people and so forth to highlight the importance of quiet time in the morning. Is that wrong? No, it's right. It's correct. What they're saying is correct. But it was highlighted so much to me that it became a law in my mind. In my mind, it became that I have to have quiet time every morning because it's pleasing to God. I have to have quiet time every morning because God enjoys. I have to have quiet time in the morning because if I don't do, then, well, who knows how this will affect. It started developing in my mind and suddenly I hated quiet time. I'm telling you my personal experience. I would force myself, put the alarm and drag myself out of bed at 5 in the morning. I would grab the Bible and stare at it for an hour. Read one verse and read it again and read it again. Read it. I have no idea what I'm reading. Close it. Go to work. What changed? It's still the same quiet time. Still living in the same house. Still waking up at the same hours. Still the same Bible. Still the same person. But what changed? What's that? Became an obligation. I came under the ministration of the law. I started doing what I'm doing because the law says so. Not because of a renewed nature, not because of a change of heart, but because the law says, the instruction says, the good master says, the good book says, you have to have quiet time. Ministration of the law says you must. The Spirit of Christ says, I love you, son. Whether you do it or not, I love you. And it changes you from inside. I started mingling with uh, sir, the, the, uh, Christian circles. And uh, I started hearing of the health message. Is it bad? No. It's good. And uh, you hear about Sabbath. Is Sabbath keeping bad? No, it's good. Well, I, I never used to swim. Do you, I, I shouldn't ask you. I never used to swim on Sabbath. Because thou shalt not do the desire of thine heart. You know? Thou shalt not do that, that which is pleasing in thy heart. How does it say? Isaiah 58 again. Huh? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, good. But then a uh, problem happened. I went mission, uh, like, like, like we're doing here, going preaching to an island called Solomon Islands. You know it, right? And uh, these people... They were not mature Christians like ours, you see. They, they set up a lunch, it was, and they put a small bowl of white rice like this. But I'm healthy. Anyway, I ate a little bit. And then they got a big bowl of fish. I'm like, what are they doing? Fish. The health message, brother. Uh, so I 
didn't eat. I mean, I'm there for a few days. I can fast, no problem. Uh, so I, I skipped the meal. Unfortunately, I skipped the meal. Because <laughs> there was no other food. But then I learned that on that island, it rains a lot. And because it rains a lot, when they plant veggies, the veggies rot. That happens in, in Fiji as well. The veggies rot. They poor people, they don't have many. They didn't know even shops there to buy. I mean, it's a remote island. We traveled for five and a half hours in a truck. You know how far we traveled? 100 k's. Five and a half hours. It tells you how remote it is. It's bad. I'm like, I said, I'm not going there anymore. I've never been there since. <clears throat> They, they, they don't have money to buy food. They don't have shops to buy food. They plant the veggies rot. Should they starve and die? What should they do? Eat fish. After all, Jesus ate fish. But in the mind that I was in, reading the health message and knowing the laws of the health message, it was a law to me. And you don't eat fish. Because the law says you don't eat flesh food. Right? And in my mind... I related righteousness with obedience to these laws. Because righteousness to me became a list of do's and don'ts. And to become more righteous, all what you have to do will go out and find out what the good works are and what the bad works are and add them to the list. And the list was continually growing. The list of the good deeds, so I become righteous. And the list of the bad deeds, so I avoid the bad things. And eating fish was one of those things that you just don't do because the law says don't do. Now, after I had that experience, I went home, you know, years after it. I was thinking, I thought, if righteousness is connected to obedience to these laws that I thought, then these people's geographical location hinders them from attaining to righteousness. Because they just have to eat fish. And if eating flesh food, not being vegetarian, not adhering to the health reform, hinders you from attaining to righteousness, then what option do they have? Starve and die? Swimming. I didn't swim on Sabbath. But three years ago, I took my family and I went to, to, to an island called Hvar on the Adriatic Sea, where my in-laws, they, they live there. We stayed there for three months. Now, on that island, it's a rocky island. Have you ever been on a rocky island? Don't go. Don't spend too much time there. I mean, it's a beautiful place. But there's no parks. I mean, I'm used to Australia to beautiful parks. I take my family in that Sabbath afternoon to a beautiful park. So the kids can walk and enjoy nature and do whatever. There's no parks. There's no Seventh-day Adventist people. I, my family, were the only Seventh-day Adventist people on the island. All right, the morning of the Sabbath started, so have breakfast, you know. I gotta, I've got three boys, right? You might all be more holy than I have, but I have three boys. And uh, you got to keep them busy, right? When you become a parent, you'll understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> so let's have breakfast. Finish breakfast, what do you do now? Well, let's, let's watch a sermon. Put a sermon, halfway through, the boys had enough, turn it off. What do you do now? Let's have an early lunch. We had an early lunch. What do you do now? It's so hot, it's like 32 degrees outside. What do you do? And then and there, it's as if God spoke to me. And I realized that then and there, these three kids that I have, what I do, either going to make them hate this Sabbath or maintain their love to this Sabbath. And as if God spoke to me, he says, uh, who created the parks? Oh, you did. Who created the ocean? Who created the ocean? Why is it right for you to walk on the Sabbath and it's not right for you to swim on the Sabbath? Who created the water? Who created the land? Who created the trees? Who created the fish? Who created the rocks? Now, in Australia, I don't travel on the Sabbath for two hours to go swim, right? Don't, 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 don't take it as a license to do whatever you want to do. Let God lead you. But what I'm telling you is this. These people that lived on that island, if they were to keep the Sabbath, they cannot keep it the way I keep it in Australia. I have parks I can go to. These people don't. The only natural, the only location of nature they have is the sea. So why can't they take their children to the sea and show them the fishes that God created? Just like you show your children the birds that God created. I told the boys, hop in the car, let's go. And went for a swim. And I pointed the fish and I pointed the rocks and I pointed the water and reminded them of the Creator. 
But, but, if righteousness is linked to the obedience to the list of do's and don'ts that I had in my mind, if I was under the ministration of the law, no way, you can't do that, because then I'll lose my righteousness. And again, their geographical location, these people who lived on the island, will hinder them from attaining to the righteousness that I can attain to. Because I have a park I can walk, they don't. Can you see where the ministration of the law can come on a practical level to us today. It might not be circumcision. It might not be keeping the law of Moses. But every good thing that God instructed you to do, and you do in your life, it can bring you under the administration of the law, or it can keep you under the administration or dispensation of grace. What depends is how do you relate to the law? How do you relate to it? How do you look at these things? Why do you do it? Because the law says so, I'm, look, I guarantee you, from my personal experience, I don't care what it is, Sabbath keeping, pies, pay, uh, tithes paying, whatever it is, if you are doing it because the law says so, take my word for it, it's only a matter of time before you hate it. The Jews tried it for 2,000 years. The law made nothing perfect. But if you do it because you have a new renewed nature, it's different. It's totally different. Sometimes though, you keep a commandment <coughs> before you understand it and later find out the blessing in it. But sometimes you just do it because God says so. Yes, but do you do it because you love God or do you do it? Yes. Yes. It's not a matter of you understanding it. It's not a matter of you knowing what the blessing is. It's a matter of why am I doing it? Jesus said, if you love me, Keep, or you will keep my commandments. In other words, he said, if you don't love me, don't bother keeping my commandments. The opposite goes as well, right? Do you know that if you are keeping the Sabbath, and you're not doing it because of faith, you're doing it because of work, you are sinning in God's eyes? What? Yes. Because the Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you obey God, not from faith, but from fear of Him, or from legalistic thing, or because you're selfish, you want a blessing, you are sinning. Because you are abusing your relationship with God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, two examples and I'll finish, to show you how this can affect even deeper. My father-in-law, I'm sure he will not watch this presentation, so he's not going to know I'm talking about him. But he told me a story when he became an Adventist. He went to visit his in-laws. His in-laws are atheists in Serbia. There's a lot of atheists in Serbia. And, and um, uh, he was there and his mother-in-law asked him, they were there on Sabbath, she was old, he was young, can you climb up that tree and tie this rope for me so I can hang the washing? He said, no. He said, no. It's the Sabbath. I'm not going to tell you what she said. And she died a non-Sabbath keeper, just so you know. But in his mind, he grew from there. From, from that time he grew, okay? He, he doesn't do that anymore. He, he, he told me because he was trying to share with me a few years back, because I was where he was. I wasn't where I am now. <laughs> I was back there. And he, he was sharing with me his experience. Uh, what would have Christ done? He would have climbed and he would have done it because it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath, right? But because his mindset was under the ministration of the law, his mindset was, you do what you do because the law says so. And the law says, thou shalt not do. Thou shalt not work on the Sabbath. He told his mother-in-law, no, I'll tie it for you tomorrow. Huh? <laughs> well, you and your Sabbath, she told him. And she climbed the tree, she tied it herself. And he told me, he says, what would have happened had she fell off that tree? Another one, and this is a horrible one. <laughs> I haven't even told it. Why are you laughing? <laughs> but this is sad. This is, this is bad. This is actually a person can be prosecuted for it. This minister, he's a minister, right? Not in the conference, independent, like us, he ministers. I won't mention his name. Although I want to, but I won't. <laughs> he, 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 was, he had. A son and a girl. His son is the eldest. He had 
I think it was his son, yes. His son, his wife was telling us the story, right? I'm not making it up. It's not a second-hand story. It's a first-hand story. After they separated, she was telling us she had tears in her eyes. She said his son was a baby, and she ran out of milk, right? She hardly had any milk. And she tried feeding him in the morning, and, and they were putting on system three meals a day. A baby. Lord have mercy. But anyway, three meals a day, because the law says three meals a day. Well, not more than three meals a day. And the law says you don't eat between meals. So the, the mother could sense the baby's hungry. But the mother knows the husband. So she sneaked her and her baby in the kitchen. She filled a bottle with apple juice. That's all what she had. And she put it in the baby's mouth. And she told me with tears in her eyes. She said the baby was... <laughs> he was starving. He was drinking it. And then the holy man walks in the kitchen. Her husband. It's like the Pharisees, you know, he walked in the kitchen, he saw it, and bzzz, a list of 613 laws came down. Thou shalt not eat between meals. Bzzz, up. You know what he did? No joke. He went, took the baby from her hands, turned the baby upside down, and put his fingers in the baby's mouth to make him vomit that juice that he drank. Because no food between meals. But that's a crime, that's a sin as well. That is a crime, that definitely is a sin. But in his mind, because he was under the menstruation of the law, he could not see but black and white. The law says, do, I do it. End of story. Hey, what about God's love? What about God's mercy? What about God's heart? What about what God wants? Can you see, when you relate to God through laws and rules, when you're controlled by the law, how you will end up acting? But if you're under grace, if you're under the dispensation of grace, you are controlled by Christ. Jesus Christ himself is living in you. And if you are Christ, if Christ shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Paul, I, I, I'll close with this verse. In, in that chapter, sorry, in that book, chapter 5 and verse, verse 13, listen what he says. He says, for brethren... You have been called unto liberty. Do you know how much liberty a Christian has? You have no idea how much. It is to an extent that Paul says, only use not this liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Paul says, look, you are free. You are set free. Amen. But do not use this freedom for an occasion to the flesh. There are people today who will want to bring you under the bondage of the old covenant. Who wants you to desire to be under the law. It is happening today. Theology is being preached where it brings you back under the law. Peacekeeping is an evidence of that. Can you cut me some grace and give me five more minutes? Less. And, and we'll finish with that. Just to show you that what I'm saying is not just, I don't like the feast and I'm saying it. No, no, no. That's what Paul says. In chapter 4, <coughs> come with me to chapter 4. He says, beginning from verse 8, well, from verse 7, he says, wherefore, wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? We just read that. A few verses earlier. What is it referring to? To the law. We, he calls it back then, the elements of the world, weak and beggarly elements, he says in here, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. What did we read a few verses later? Verse 21, tell me that desire to be under the law. What did they desire to be under? The law. He tells them here, you desire to be under this weak and beggarly elements. It's the law. Right? <laughs> I won't go too much into explaining. Get the book. But notice how he realized, he saw that they were desiring to be under the law. Notice the very next verse. You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you. He tells them, 
lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What are these? Observe days and months and times and years. What is he referring to? Remember, before you answer, these people desired to be saved by keeping the law. They desired to go under the old covenant. Do you think a person who desired to keep all the law of God will turn to paganism? No. So don't tell me that this is referring to pagan stuff. These people are desiring to be saved by the law. These people are being deceived by Judaizers who are sticklers to the law. They cannot possibly be going into paganism. Paul is telling them in context, he says, Look, you knew, before you knew God, you did service unto them which by nature are no God. You are in bondage to these things that are, are no gods. How be it, now when you know God, sorry, where is it? But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire to be in bondage? How is it that you are turning again to bondage? How is it that you are seeking bondage again? It's not the same type of bondage. Back then was bondage to paganism. Now you're seeking bondage to the law. But it's the same thing. It's bondage. You're going back to bondage. That's what he's telling them. And he's giving them the evidence. You are starting to keep the feasts. I am afraid of you. That's what he tells them. So, in closing, brothers and sisters, a question I want to leave with you. Why do you do what you do? What is your motive? What's in your heart? Do you do what you do because you have a renewed nature? Because that it's an internal thing? Or do you do what you do because you are Obeying and observing external laws and they are controlling you. When God said, I will write my law in their hearts, He did not mean I'm going to get a very thin pen and write the Ten Commandments on your hearts. He didn't mean that. That's what I used to believe. He didn't mean that. Paul says the whole law is summed in one word. What is it? When God said, I'm going to write my law in your hearts, He said, I'm going to give you a new heart, a heart of flesh. I'm going to turn that selfishness into you into love. And this love will lead you to obey me. This love will lead you to manifest righteousness. So why do you do what you do? I pray that you will be doing it because the love of God is controlling your heart. Amen? Amen. Let us close with a prayer. Father in heaven above, we thank you, Lord, uh, with all our hearts for demonstration of the Spirit, dear Lord, for the dispensation of grace that you have placed us under. We thank you, Father, for the liberty that you have given us in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for the power and the life that you have given us that allows us to use this liberty to your glory and to your honor. I pray, dear Father, for each and every head that is bowed in here, dear Lord, especially as we close this camp meeting now, that uh, you will go with us, dear Father. You'll be the God, you'll be the King and ruler of our hearts. That you will fill all our hearts, dear Lord, with your spirit, with the life of your son, Jesus. And you will help us, dear Lord, to serve and to live, to speak and to do, to act and think in a way, dear Lord, that Jesus would do, that will bring glory to your name and to the name of your son, Jesus. May you keep us all safe, dear Lord, and close to your hearts until we meet again, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.